Before we start talking about data-driven publishing, I'd like to invite two startups here on stage who are going to pitch for three minutes each. Hi, my name is Marcus. I'm one of the founders of Focal Analytics and uh, I'll continue my pitch in German. <laughs> uh, meine Damen und Herren, Sie alle wissen es, es ist heutzutage sehr schwierig mit online Content, mit gutem Online Content ehrliches Geld zu verdienen. Ähm, Auflagen gehen zurück und Werbung auf digitalen Angeboten wird von Usern blockiert. Ähm, es ist auch verständlich, keiner ihrer Leser hat Lust, von riesigen Werbebannern auf der Website überflutet zu werden. Es wird also keinen Weg daran vorbeigehen, äh, digitale Abos zu ermöglichen. Das haben wir bei Video-Streaming-Plattformen ganz ähnlich erlebt. Da hat es gut funktioniert. Leser, äh, das Publikum ist bereit, dafür Geld auszugeben für guten Content, aber sie schließen jetzt nicht zehn Abonnements ab, sondern halt nur eins. Das heißt, wir werden Online-Publisher erleben, die von diesem Wandel sehr stark profitieren werden und wir werden aber auch Online-Publisher erleben, die es nicht schaffen werden, ihre Leser in Zahlen der Abonnenten zu verwandeln. Um Leser also zum Abonnement zu bewegen, müssen wir genau verstehen, mit welcher Leserschaft wir es zu tun haben und welche Inhalte relevant und interessant für die potenziellen Abonnenten sind. Erst dann kann ich gezielte Maßnahmen ergreifen, um auch meine Aborate zu erhöhen. Ganz im Sinne dieses Panels, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Mit Focal Analytics bieten wir eine Analytics-Lösung an, die Online-Publishern genau dabei hilft. Wir erfassen detaillierte Daten darüber, wie Leser mit dem Angebot Zeit verbringen und dabei haben wir drei Schwerpunkte. Ähm, einerseits die loyalen Leser identifizieren, wir müssen also diejenigen finden, die schon regelmäßig auf meiner Plattform sind. Das heißt, diejenigen, die potenziell bereit sind, zu einem Abonnenten zu werden, weil sie meine Inhalte schon schätzen. Wenn ich verstehe, welche Inhalte für genau diese Gruppe relevant sind, dann kann ich diese Inhalte gezielt streuen und weiterentwickeln. Außerdem die Langzeithelden identifizieren. Das heißt, es gibt Artikel, die hervorragend laufen auf Plattformen, deren Wert aber oft gar nicht erkannt wird, weil man sie im Dschungel dieser ganzen Artikel nicht mehr findet. Wir bieten dafür Analysen, die sozusagen den Blick nicht nur auf heute und die letzten sieben Tage richten, sondern den Artikel über den gesamten Lebenszyklus betrachten und automatische Analysen dafür anbieten. Und als dritten Punkt sinnvolle Metriken. Wir alle wissen, dass die Clickrate oder die Anzahl oder die Länge der, der, des Besuchs nicht repräsentiert, wie gut ein Artikel ist oder wie wahrscheinlich es ist, dass daraus ein Abonnent wird. Wir entwickeln komplexere Metriken, in die verschiedenste Parameter gewichtet einfließen, die aber nach wie vor interpretierbar für verschiedene Rollen im Verlagshaus bleiben, sodass man sinnvolle Entscheidungen davon ableiten kann. Wir launchen Focal Analytics Ende des Jahres. Sie als Online-Publisher können von Anfang an dabei sein. Kommen Sie gerne nach dem Panel zu unserem Stand direkt vor der Tür. Wir freuen uns auf ein kurzes Gespräch. Vielen Dank. Jetzt haben wir sehr wenig Zeit, deswegen versuche ich das mal ganz, ganz zackig zu machen. Also uns wurde eindringlich gesagt, nur drei Minuten. Das wird jetzt ein Turbo-Rundown zu Kerngedanke. Kerngedanke, das ist unser Startup und Kerngedanke ist eine Software-as-a-Service für Social Media Management. Und wenn man sich überlegt, was heute online an Inhalten veröffentlicht wird, was ist da nicht wirklich social? Also überlegen wir und schauen wir uns nochmal das Problem an, vergegenwärtigen wir uns das. Naja, das Wettbewerbsumfeld, das ist größer und komplizierter geworden online, wesentlich komplizierter für alle, die ein paar Jährchen älter sind und sich an die Zeit bis vor zehn Jahren erinnern können, da war das doch noch einfacher, vor 20 noch mehr. Es gibt Fake News, Fluff News, Content Marketing, Influencer Content, alles mögliche Dinge, mit denen wir uns messen lassen müssen, wenn wir journalistische Inhalte machen. Das Publikum ist jetzt auch noch zu einem Überfluss verteilt auf ganz, ganz vielen Plattformen und die alle haben unterschiedliche Anforderungen und Eigenheiten, die bedient werden wollen. Auch noch mal eine zusätzliche Komplexität. Die Schlagzahl für Inhalte, die ist viel höher geworden. Es reicht nicht mehr, nur einmal einen Inhalt zu machen, 
der einmal die Woche kommt, geschweige denn einmal im Monat. Nein, mehrfach pro Tag gilt es, ein Instagram, eine Facebook-Page oder ein Twitter zu bedienen. Und das hat natürlich unglaublich viele Implikationen für die Art und Weise, wie wir das orchestrieren, wie wir es analysieren, wie wir mit all diesen kleinteiligen Informationen und Inhalten umgehen. Die Anforderungen an die multimediale Aufbereitung, die sind auch gestiegen. Also die Zeiten, wo wir 2007 auf Twitter irgendwie nur einen Text posten konnten mit einem Hashtag maximal, die sind natürlich längst vorbei. Was man heute machen muss, ist, da müssen noch Medienassets mit. Wir müssen Bilder, bearbeitete Bilder, richtig zugeschnitten, mit einem richtigen Filter versehen, besser sogar noch Bewegtbild mit veröffentlicht werden. Und das hat natürlich eine ganze Reihe von Konsequenzen. Das ist also die schöne neue Welt, die gegenwärtige, wenn wir ehrlich sind, sogar auch die Welt, wie sie existiert seit ein paar Jahren. Und wir von Kerngedanke sagen, Mensch, und wir haben die Lösung dafür. Das, was wir haben, ist ein Software-as-a-Service, der alles an einem Ort bündelt. Ich kann an einer Stelle all meine Facebook, Instagram Präsenzen durchsuchen. Ich kann Inhalte nehmen, ich kann diese Inhalte nochmal neu Repurposen. Das heißt, ich habe einen Inhalt, ich habe ein Video, was ich auf YouTube mit viereinhalb Minuten Länge veröffentlicht habe, aber da gibt es vielleicht Segmente, die ich als vier Sekunden Schnipsel als Instagram Story veröffentlichen möchte, verteilt über die nächste Woche. All das kann ich in Kerngedanke entsprechend machen, ohne dass ich Final Cut dafür oder Premiere Pro anschmeißen muss. Man kann einfach Dinge bearbeiten und zu einem Überfluss, super wichtig bei der Kleinteiligkeit, kann man wunderbar einfache für Journalisten und wirklich Inhalte erstellende Menschen verständliche Analysen ableiten. Das haben wir uns nicht nur ganz alleine ausgedacht. Wir machen unglaublich viel, viele Nutzertests mit einer ganzen Reihe von Early Adoptern, die wir haben. Die Namen kann ich jetzt nicht aufzählen, aber vielleicht am Stand ein paar verraten. Da gibt es eine ganze Reihe Medienunternehmungen, klein, mittel und auch sehr groß, die mit uns eng zusammenarbeiten und uns sagen, wie ihre Bedürfnisse ausschauen. Wir sind ein Team aus vielen Medientechnologen, Geeks. Wir haben Business Developer, wir haben Designer und wir sind natürlich alle einschließlich mir Informatik- und Produktentwicklungsgeeks. Das ist also Kerngedanke. Wir würden uns freuen, wenn Sie bei uns am Stand kurz vorbeischauen oder uns eine E-Mail schicken. Besten Dank. So quickly, you can meet the startups outside if you like. There is a lounge area right across this room. Um, we're going to talk about data-driven publishing now. We've all heard people saying data is a new oil and it's clear that publishers as well as marketing and PR firms know a lot more about readers and target groups than they knew a decade ago. But how exactly is data being used to make a better product? How do users react to it? We have four experts from different fields here on stage who will share their insights with you today. Welcome on stage. We have... Um, Tor Jacobson, Senior Vice President for Consumer Marketing and Revenue at Chipstead Media. Corinna Voss, who's Managing Director at HBI, an international PR and marketing communication service. Uh, Matthias Kienchle, who is Managing Director of Media Favoriten, a subsidiary company at Südkorea for over 15 years and is also a digital CEO for the regional da uh, daily newspaper. And Brian O'Connor is founder and partner at Rethink. Rethink is a company for the development of innovative communi communication strategies and a consultancy for transformative communication. All four um, participants here on stage have brought a little presentation and Tor is starting. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I'm Tor Jakobsen. I'm heading the consumer business in Shipstead, meaning our subscription revenue and other consumer revenue we have. So first, I would like to talk very quickly about Shipstead. Uh, Shipstead is a Nordic company based uh, headquartered in Oslo, uh, existing of three areas. It's the Nordic marketplaces, which is places where you buy and sell stuff. Um, Then you have the news media division, where I come from, uh, which where ships that started. And then we have a growth area, especially in f uh, fintech. Um, if you look at the media division and how we work with the consumer revenue, we work very on cross of the brands, because we have a lot of brands in, in the Nordics, so approximately 20 different brands, everything from major brands to more niche brands, etc. Uh, so in this area of subscription, we think it's uh, smart to work together because it's so many uh, similar things and we can learn from each other and we can make a model I will talk a little bit about. So we have um, 3.9 um, um, million Norwegian crowns, which is like 390 million um, euro. 
and approximately 700 million in purely digital revenue. Uh, 1.3 million subscribers, 770,000 pure digital. Um, our big target is to reach uh, 1 billion uh, in purely digital revenue in 2020 uh, regarding digital subscribers. And that is uh, doubling from the level in 2017. So we are in the middle of a kind of a wild growth uh, phase right now, actually. So it's, it's um, yeah, good times. Um, so regarding data and, um, and the data-driven publishing, we see that data is used for more and more and more of our processes. And it's the core engine in a lot of things, from pricing, from uh, testing paywall, to churn, to how we communicate, to uh, what kind of articles we should present uh, for, the, um, um, for our um, readers, etc. So actually it's in many and more and more fields, I would say. So examples on that. Uh, this is our algorithmic front page. So Aftenposten, which is the biggest subscription brand in Norway. It's, we have started with an um, algorithmic uh, front page. So uh, every person has a different front page. So I mean, some of the same articles, the top articles, for instance, is, is always the same. But a lot of the articles is depending on uh, the reading habit. How often do you read us? Uh, what kind of articles do you like? Uh, uh, what kind of topics do you like, etc. And after we change to this, um, uh, the reading is up approximately 10%. So this is much more personalized than it uh, used to be. Um, that's one example. W one other example is the dynamic paywall. Uh, we have a data model in Sweden for Svenska Dagbladet, uh, suggesting which article, if an article should be paid or free. Um, so uh, it, it gives help to the, um, to the editorial team. Uh, in every article, uh, and sometimes the data model is uh, not agree with the <laughs> with um, editorial team, um, and, and that's interesting. And we see that especially when it's articles and content that also uh, the competitors have for free. Then maybe the, uh, the editorial team don't want to lock it, but we see it's very linked to the brands. We can still lock it. A third example is market-based pricing. Uh, so. In Norway right now, we have um, we, we can uh, see the um, pattern of um, willingness to pay for each customer. So we are able to have dynamic pricing. We haven't implemented yet, but we're using it to different um, discount scales. Um, last example is um, a very simple example, but it's the onboarding process for a new um, uh, subscriber. It used to be very simple, so after five days you got an email, then after eight days you got a new email, then you got an SMS, etc. Now it's trigger-based and personalized. So this is an example from Aftenposten. You can choose between those three editors there. They can guide you through the first couple of days and weeks and months of your subscription. So all emails, for instance, if you choose Trina Eilertsen to the left there, all kind of communication, emails, SMS, or touch points in the products is from Trina, suggesting things or giving you advice, etc. And it's of course not her writing all the emails, but it's a lot of predefined communication that is a little bit more personalized. So that's some examples for me in the beginning. Thank you. Muss ich noch was drücken? <laughs> ah, yeah, here we go. Yeah, uh, as I said, my name is Corinna Voss, and um, I'm from an agency here based in Munich, and a bit on background on us. Um, let's see if I can get this going. Passing, yeah. Um, we, as I said, we are based in Munich, and we are um, doing all kinds of communication around innovation, innovation companies coming from technology, coming from new mobility, e-mobility, sustainability. So innovation is really at the core of the agency. And also we, um, we work with international partners worldwide. And I thought it's maybe best to bring you an example of how we used AI and data-driven analysis for um, a survey that we are doing on a regular basis. As I said, we're part of WorldCom. 
And in 2018, WorldCom initiated what we call the Confidence Index. The idea was to, to see or analyze what is moving CEOs and CMOs worldwide. What are their concerns? What are the topics they're very confident in? And we did this in a very traditional approach. As you can see, we had about, I think, 540 people we asked worldwide. We asked questions. The results were, specific, were based on these specific questions. And yes, we we got some really valuable insights, but we somehow thought, okay, for a global organization, this is just not where we want to go. And is that really what concerns CMOs and CEOs? Or are there things they may be talking on social media or commenting that is a completely different piece of cake and we just couldn't by our questions get a hold of that? So we, and we went... Um, we, we, we started to look at new ways of doing such a, such a survey. And this year, we, the confidence index will be completely different. In 2019, we've worked with a company in Canada based in Toronto called Advanced Symbolics. It's our partner here. Uh, and they have an algorithm which is called Poly. I have no idea why it's called Poly, but it's called Poly. And Poly is, um, has helped us to analyze, to, we put up hypotheses and then to analyze and find out about 600, nearly 60, uh, 65,000 um, CMOs and C-level, C-suite decision makers worldwide. And the nice thing was that um, we were not limited to certain geographies or languages. It's actually really global. And um, it was all based on publicly available um, material, which made it also good for us because it's all in line with data, uh, with data laws or data privacy laws. Um, and um, what we also did, because online data is persistent, we could also do and go backwards to 2018 and really prove the results we had from this small panel. Uh, on how how correct were, were those findings and, and mirror them to the 2019 confidence index. The index isn't out yet. It's coming out, I think, in about two weeks. Uh, anybody who's interested can write me an email. I'm happy to share the executive summary. So at the end of the day, um, we had, we really had a much broader scale of what we could dig on. I mean, this data gave us um, broader ge geography, I mentioned that, a bigger sample size, it, and it gives us different levels of understanding. We had new findings, new ideas by, uh, by us by, by analyzing hypotheses. Uh, we realized that uh, opinions were shifting um, in time, so we, we really could have a, what we call elastic search in showing trends. Um, and last but not least, what we as an agency are interested in, data tells us stories, and stories is what storytelling is what we should be about. So um, we really found a lot of unique stories in this data, yes, the stories that we might not have found out in the traditional way. And, and, and I think a lot of companies and agencies have these data at their fingertips uh, in HubSpot, in, in their social media channels, but it's important to analyze and use this data to really tell stories that want to be told. Thank you. Hey there. Uh, Thanks for this nice intro, Ter Teresa um, and uh, Lisa, for having me here. Um, I am Matthias from a local publisher. We are um, coming from the very south of Germany, um, and we are doing news, like we did 75 years uh, from now. And uh, we think about data as a driver for transformation. So at the core, data helps us, or should be helping, to change our minds and uh, the way we are uh, thinking about our audience and the people we are serving. So we talk a lot about bringing data to life that uh, comes to mind of the people working with us and bringing it to action. So I had um, the idea to show you 
what we are thinking about, and maybe some of this is uh, helpful with, uh, for you. So in the news uh, business, we uh, have been waiting for the news. So looking at the tickers, looking at the email uh, outlook, um, and uh, hoping that something will occur. And now we are thinking in, a, in another way to engage audience like, okay, oh, great. Um, so first we have to think for who will we be there? So what are our target audiences? Um, we think in a way of programming our content, not just the news flow uh, bringing through because news are everywhere, they are uh, not worthy. Um, and we are thinking about goals. What do we want to achieve with our content? Uh, and therefore we build, um, okay, sorry for that. We build uh, an article score, um, helping us to understand what people are thinking about our content, who um, is engaging and helping us to drive the right decisions. Um, and we are talking also about quality manage management, which is in a um, journalistic way, new way of thinking, because journalistic quality is one one issue and data and journalistic value or quality wasn't uh, connected before because page views and clicks, this was a number from uh, fancy digital guys and not measuring the quality of the journalistic content. So now we are bringing this together. And how we will do this? Um, one example, we had an article score and it's some case in a database in the reporting um, and the author has to uh, dig in and read this complicated report in his email. So we thought about bringing this data to life uh, and our cool guys programmed this little Chrome plugin. Uh, which is basically translating the, the, um, the, the several numbers in the score uh, in real words. So everyone without any uh, data skills can read this and um, uh, enables himself to get the best um, idea of what is the next step for me to bring my content um, or to bring it to more performance, like uh, engaging users. So this is one thing. Another thing um, is making dashboards that are in a casual environment, uh, like in a um, cafe, coffee zone um, or in uh, our Mensa, so uh, people can speak about it in an informal and casual way. And the last thing, um, I think we copied this from Shipset or uh, the, the Scandics because they are way beyond us. Um, uh, thinking about how many efforts do we make in different topics like sports or like some streets we are uh, covering uh, and um, how high is the accuracy of uh, in case of uh, article score or paywall visits. So this is a way the newsroom discusses data and uh, they can adapt what the data tells them. So this was it. I'm here for discussion and your questions. Thanks. Thank you. This working? Yeah, um, I didn't. Um, yeah, I've only got one slide here because I wanted to tell you a little story. That's me and. <laughs> what was that? Ten years ago. Ten years yeah. ago. Yeah. Uh, I was at the time I was working for Axel Springer, and we'd uh, spent two years um, trying to turn uh, the publishing house into kind of a, a digital powerhouse um, uh, with mobile apps, website changes. Um, we also decided to embrace social media, which was the first publishing company at the time. We had a big sit down and decided to do it. And at that presentation, I was showing our new prototype, Iconist, and as you can see. Theresa wasn't very interested. <laughs> <laughs> and she was doing that, what I think um, people do all the time is they're like multitasking, looking at other content when somebody, and I'm standing beside her, showing it to her. So that's actually, a, in a way, kind of the problem we have nowadays as publishers or storytellers. So actually a week or two after I left Axel Springer and founded Rethink, um, we're in Berlin now, we have grown to around 60 staff. And the interesting thing is around a third of those staff are data people. Like we call them content intelligence experts. And that's been quite an interesting journey because we started publishing basically mostly digital publishing, which sometimes do print for fun, but it's a 90% digital social. 
and a lot of global. We've done an awful lot of automotive global for brands like Porsche and Volkswagen, which is, I think, very, very strange because when you're dealing in 80 or 90 markets, the whole publishing setup changes and then trying to find usable data becomes an incredible challenge. So that's basically all I wanted to say about me. I've got another a few insights I'll give um, during the talk. Yeah, thank you for all the insights. Um, if you have any questions during the session, we have a digital tool called Slido. You can see it here on this slide. Um, if you use the hashtag MTM19, you find it and our room number is 14C. You can type in questions there, but you can also just ask at the end in German in, and English, whatever you prefer. So I'd like to start with you, Brian, because you have extensive experience in the media and you've seen the first days of online media. Can you tell us a bit about how data-driven publishing has transformed the industry in the past 10, 15 years? Well, I, I suppose in, in some ways it's, it's destroyed it in some ways. This is, this, it's a big problem. I mean, I don't worry about journalism anymore because I'm selling advertising, basically. You know, I'm basically... I'm kind of away from that now, but I do think that there was a moment um, around 10 or 12 years ago where it was a very interesting time for publishing. I, I think I told you this the other day, I was working for Handelsblatt, it was, a, it was a, um, a business newspaper in Dusseldorf, and I was part of the editorial team who decided what was the page one uh, for the weekend, for our, for our Friday issue, which is a big deal. And I remember there was an editor, um, Olaf, who kept trying to get onto page one, we wouldn't let him because he thought his, his themes were too weird. And he had this, this was 2007, he had this thing about this company called Facebook. He thought it was gonna be a really big deal. I was thinking, yeah, come on, nobody's interested in this stuff. So what he did was, he published it on handelsblatt.com and got so many clicks, much more than our actual lead story, that we had to publish it in print. And that was a big learning. I then went, moved to Springer, and I noticed when we moved to Springer that we were already with our backs against the wall. We were fighting a war with Spiegel directly to get the, the biggest share of the market in quality um, news publishing. But we'd also decided to make moves into, into um, digital applications and, which I still don't think most German publishing houses do, we'd actually embrace social media. We had an expert who was going to Menlo Park, who was talking to Facebook. And also, we weren't just going on popularity. I mean, I, I suppose I can disfocus online here and nobody really cares because they basically you know, they're chasing likes and they're chasing interactions. But we were trying to find a way to create quality journalism and actually keep the conversation going. Uh, one last point, when I worked at Handelsblatt, a lot of CEOs came from companies and they said, what's interesting about good media is the surprise effect. So they were getting clippings from their communication chef every day, which was all, it was, I met Renny Oberman from the Deutsche Telekom at the time, and he said, all I get is stuff that's about telecoms, but I need to know other stuff. And that only happens, it doesn't work online. It never works on a good website. We learned that when we relaunched Welt HD and uh, World, uh, Welt Online, that people never even went to the homepage. Where we curated our content, they weren't going. They were going through search engines and stuff, to stuff that we didn't really care about. And that became a very difficult job to try and get the stories that we cared about to the top of people's mind and, and, and actually improve our brand. Mm -hmm. So, Matthias, Brian is saying data has ruined journalism in a way, but I, yeah. I think you see a huge opportunity, especially for local journalism, right? Yeah, but uh, I'd like to emphasize this uh, because um, we were talking about the wrong numbers, like page views or clicks, mm -hmm. and they ruined uh, this trust in data. So, um, the data didn't show showed us how the user was thinking and feeling, uh, it just showed someone in the world clicked on it. So um, for us, it was a dramatic change when we established our own uh, data and tech stack with uh, first party, da party data. So we could uh, rely on this data and um, this showed us more what our readers, our core readers will do to think about you have different audiences. You have flybys on your website and you have people coming by three or four times a day. And um, this helps to gain more trust in this data. And um, as we uh, talk, talked about these numbers, we also had a common sense of these numbers. Um, like when you have um, in the ad team, uh, 
uh, ad impressions in the newsroom uh, page views or uh, clicks and uh, the product team uh, had uh, their, their only fancy uh, numbers, they couldn't speak together and they had no um, common feeling of for who are we uh, working and how is it evolving. So. Mm -hmm. How much time did this transformation take you? Um, I think one or two years. So uh, you have to get your own uh, analytics uh, tool, which first party data. You have to uh, connect it with your CMS and your CRM. I hope you have one. Um, and uh, then, then uh, bring it to life in reports or tools mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, Tor, uh, Shipstead is uh, very much advanced uh, in the European media landscape. Can you tell us a bit how you build up your operations and how you apply data to editorial decisions right now? Yeah, I mean, it's going through many phases and I don't think we are uh, ready yet. So it's still a little bit in the beginning, I would try to say, because um, but I think uh, when you shift from print to digital, it's very different because uh, in print you don't really know what people like or what they read or how they engage with an article. And then we came to the digital space and then you have, abs you know, absolutely everything. You can measure everything. And that was a fun, um, and then you, you, I think you have a good point and we started to measure a little bit of wrong things in the beginning. But then when the subscription economy c came, it went a little bit different because then it was more about the, um, the reader and the customer and uh, what made them want to pay and stay, etc. And that has also changed a lot. And then also I think that for the editors and the journalists, it went a little bit more fun because then it was all about um, uh, how can I make people want to pay for this article or engage with this article. Uh, so, so I think it's been a travel, but the travel is not ready yet. So I mean, just mm -hmm. halfway or something. Yeah. Corinna, you're working in PR and one of the questions here is how important is gut feeling? Um, how much data do your customers expect right now? Yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I think gut feeling is still a big thing, but gut feeling based on data. So I, I think what, what has changed, I'm especially when you do social media programs for customers, they expect you to, um, to base your decisions for certain topics and things that are trending on data, mm -hmm. not so much on what you personally prefer. And I think it's, it's actually a mix, as I said, you make decisions that are gut feeling, but they're based on, on your findings and not just on your gut. Mm -hmm. And how is it transforming PR? <laughs> well, I've been Obviously, I've been in that business for some time, so I've seen so many transformations. And I think the, the past five to ten years have been really changing our job completely. Um, we are much more thorough on content creation. We have to, 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 to invent or, or put things into bit bigger context. So it's, it's an exciting time. Uh, it's a challenging time, I think, for a lot of us, but it's also a very exciting time. Mm -hmm. um, Matthias, we have a question from the audience. Um, someone wants to know what goes into the article score. And you showed us in your presentation that, you, um, that one um, of the goals you wanted to achieve is make it understandable to every editor, even if he or she doesn't have any data expertise. Yeah, um, I understood uh, what goals are in this article score. Now, what, what uh, data goes into oh, the article data. score and um, how important was it to, to make it understandable for every editor? Okay, uh, there goes the basic analytic data like who reads it, uh, just a flyby user or is it a uh, um, loyal user or is it a subscriber and subscriber rates higher in, in the score. Uh, like uh, engaging factors, like how deep will they scroll, how um, um, is the um, uh, ratio between calculated read time and uh, real read time, like in case of uh, numbers of words. Um, so it shows you, is your content structured right and um, in the right length for, for this topic or this content piece, um, and interactions. Uh, so, uh, sharing or, um, or commenting or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and uh, I think it's crucial to develop such a score with the 
editors and uh, not with everyone in the newsroom, uh, but um, sure you have to um, integrate them very early to gain their trust in these numbers. So this should be no KPI, someone uh, fancy head of data strategy uh, had uh, developed in the last months, uh, but it's, it's developing. We launched a first version, it wasn't perfect, but we earned trust. So these numbers uh, showed more the true quality or uh, value of this content. Mm -hmm. So Brian, do you, do you have a best practice scenario for integrating data into the newsroom? Um, yes, actually, well, what I do is I try to set on a kind of, like you, like you do with a score idea, we have a thing we call three R's and it's uh, reach, um, resonance, and I forgot what the third one is. <laughs> no, no, unfortunately not. <laughs> it's a, it's a, uh, just a stage moment. But what we basically do is we set, we set a score between how, I'll tell you, stuff that has a lot of reach, relevance is a third R. Stuff that has a lot of reach is generally not, I'll give you an example from Porsche, right? They just brought out the most incredible car in the world. It's, it's actually more, more incredible than the, than the iPhone. But they're not talking about it in the way that needs to be talked about. They're talking about it in an advertising way. So they're trying to create bang. Yeah? That won't sell a 90,000 euro car. That's not the way it works. They need to go to do exactly what Jonathan Iva does at Apple. And I think it's very funny. I tell this to people in marketing. I say the most, the most potent form of content in the world is a kind of a balding, overweight English guy talking about milling metal, which is Jonathan Ivey when he brings out the iPhone. It's absolutely journalistic. It's like, it's like really good quality journalism and everybody looks at it. And all the other labels that we work with are trying to be funny and create buzz and do all this advertising stuff. And we've done a rethink the last 10 years is basically be very like journalists. And um, I always say to our marketing people, I used to sell what you give away for free. And we used to sell it, we used to have much smaller budgets, like an, an advertising budget or a, a production budget for a newspaper is a hundredth of what an advertising spends on an ad. Mm. And we'd actually get people to follow that, be interested in it. So it's, for us, being in advertising has been totally easy because it's just a no-brainer. You know, I met this guy at Audi last year and he wanted to know why he'd done this huge photo shoot in New York with the FC, FC Bayern Munich players and his new car and nobody was interested. And I said, you didn't need to go to New York. You could have just done hashtag Frank Ribery and spend 10 euros and got the same effect, but he'd spent 10 million. That's the problem with advertising. Mm. It's, it's, it's fun actually to see how they burn money all the time, but I suppose it's, I'd, li I'd like to have had that money when I was working in a newspaper. Mm. Um, Tor, how has uh, data impacted revenue at Shipstead? Uh, I would say a lot, because uh, especially when you uh, look at um, uh, subscription, because you can target uh, so much. You don't, you know, so much more about which kind of articles um, will sell and which kind of article will make you stay, and to different people in the different segment. So, I mean, it's it's actually a lot easier to um, uh, be in the subscription business now than it used to be, because mm -hmm. we have so much information. Um, and I think um, in, an important point is that a lot of the model we, we for instance, have is very simple. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, some of them are more advanced, for instance, like the front page uh, showed, but some is very, very simple. It's more, uh, more about uh, having uh, very um, basic data linked to um, um, the business understanding. Uh, so, I think that, that's the important point that a lot of things can be pretty simple to make a lot of business value. Mm -hmm. yeah. Corinna, can you tell us a bit um has data transformed the effectiveness of your campaigns? And what is your approach when you use data for, for research and coming up with ideas? Yeah, it has definitely um, helped us in becoming more efficient. I mean, there's always room for improvement for a lot of these stuff, but it has us, um, it has helped us to be more precise on which story you want to tap into who we decide should be the spokesperson, the thought leader. Mm -hmm. So really it has helped us become more precise and on the mm -hmm. spot. I mean, obviously you cannot have this big algorithm on every campaign you're doing. You sometimes have to rely on data that sits in your company anyway, but definitely it has helped us to be more efficient and more precise, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I was discussing with Brian yesterday. Do your customers expect too much from data sometimes? 
I think there are many, it depends on where they are. I mean, we work with mostly technology companies, so there is enough, uh, they are fine to data and technology. So I think for them, it's easier to grasp what data can do for them and that data is not any, everything, right? It can just be a hub or backbone, so to say, for a campaign. So I think it really depends on uh, how far advanced the customers, some maybe believe in it and worship it, but data is, cannot be the only answer. And I think that there are different, ver ver it varies the understanding, but it's not, not the only thing, right? Mm. Brian, you mentioned it earlier. How important uh, is risk taking and surprising? I think if, you're, if your data setup is good, mm -hmm. You can do both. When we were talking about, and I think that's what what you were saying in a way, it's 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 this. Actually, it's not after publishing that you want to look at data. It's before you publish. So we try to set up a matrix that we know what's relevant to the consumer in the end of the day, and then you can actually do a lot, and you can do stuff that's really on the money. You know, that's that attracts attention, but also be surprising and opulent and creative and and what, but. We, for instance, with Porsche, we created 18 different personas of types of drivers. And that's quite interesting mm -hmm. because they only had like, I think about four or five beforehand and now we're being much broader. And then you can publish content that would never have been in their marketing fit. And that's actually what we did in a newspaper. A newspaper was always great because it had 25 or 30 different voices. You'd have like hard news voices, people in the commentary pages, and this kind of mix of voices when you opened a newspaper, went on a great website like The Guardian, is actually what makes it it makes you keep coming back. And we try to apply that now to marketing. So we mm -hmm. use data to find different voices, to search topics. We use Crimson Hexagon. I try to find what conversations are going on social media. I had to do that when I was working with Volkswagen at, in, during Dieselgate. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of data research then. Mm -hmm. Matthias, you mentioned it in your presentation. On the one hand, you have uh, data telling you what your readers are interested in. On the other hand, you have journalistic values and what your editorial team think it's, is important. How do you bring that together? Uh, thank you for this question mm -hmm. because, uh, um, like there is sense, Stadt Bauchgefühl. Um, we are talking about um, both data and Bauchgefühl. Uh, like data drives uh, creativity mm -hmm. and uh, helps to make better tests. Uh, not just I'm writing something. I don't know anything about it will work or not. Uh, when you have data, you can rely on something you've learned and then try something new. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a crucial thing in such a transformation business. If you have a legacy uh, company and news business is legacy, uh, you have to change minds and you're talking the whole day about data, 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 and the other side gets lost. So you have to combine and get it together all the time again. And um, I think we, we've learned this um, in a bad way because we talked a lot about, uh, mm -hmm. about data and now we have to go one step uh, back and yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what was the process to get everyone on board in your editorial team? Was it hard? Mm. <laughs> When I think about the last uh, two years, no, because like Tor said, um, when you aim to um, get loved by customers mm -hmm. or your readers, and they show this in paying money for your content, uh, the editorial stuff is uh, on board. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> Um, Tor, you have an algorithmic front page. Can you tell us a bit more about how it works and is your vision to, to automate everything there? No, because um, like you said, that uh, some of the um, content is totally the same for all people reading it. So I will say approximately 30% plus or minus is the same for all readers. But then the 70% the rest is, um, is um, a little bit different and that depends on your personality or, or why what you are interested in but also on timing because it, it can be an article we know that it will interest you a lot but it may maybe it's like three days since last time you visited after boston so then you will have that article then because it shouldn't be the same front page for a person reading it three times a day than the person reading it uh, two times a week Mm -hmm. so that, that's the main difference than uh, that and uh, so the timing and also the um, interest mm -hmm. but, but still 30 percent is the same mm. yeah. um, Corinna we have a question for you from the audience um, 
what's the most important metric uh, to measure the success of strategic communication? Well, it, it, I think it depends on the it depends on the campaign what the most mm -hmm. important metrics is. Um, it can be reach, it can be impact, it can be in engagement. So I, I think it, it really depends on what the campaign is set for and what you wanted to achieve with that campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be a combination of various factors. Yeah. Right? Matthias, we've learned from you that data is uh, saving local journalism right now. Can you share with us what you've learned about local readers, what they are looking for when they subscribe? Uh, yeah, but we are just at the beginning. Um, uh, one thing we learned right now that uh, people are very interested in their nearby region. So it's a no-brainer, but uh, it still is in the digital era. So uh, we established a way to deliver um, frequent content for these regions, mm -hmm. uh, for every single village in our uh, region. Mm -hmm. So this helped us to um, gain a, um, 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 an image of a product. Like when you're coming on a homepage or an article and the most people are coming on articles directly, we try to get them on the, on the small town uh, page and delivering them uh, in newsletters and push uh, in the apps uh, a constant uh, flow of content that engages them. And the next thing is this one, uh, ship sets uh, already there, um, like uh, bringing the content they're interested in, and this time they want to read it. So this is the next uh, step for mm -hmm. us. Brian, you told us already one th third of your staff is data people. Um, how do you train your staff? How has it transformed um, work at your company and how do people keep up? Um, to be honest with you, I haven't a clue what most of them do. Um, <laughs> I know I, I realized it was an imperative um, to, to create, uh, as my job is I design, um, I think, customer journeys. Mm -hmm. And it was, used to be reader journeys. So I always try to find a way for somebody to navigate their way through a product story or a story. So we did definitely look for people who could sell content, who could push it at the back end. We also look for people who could research and define personas and give us as creative, give our creative teams kind of impulses. But then we were also looking for people to test content. And so I think there's like, there's, there's at least five different types of people working there. And some of them are just doing, we're doing stuff for the telecom at the moment, which is a strategy, just trying to find out what is the real brand resonance. And stuff like that. and that's like, that's basically kind of a really fun intellectual work. And we get, it used to be we used to get paid for pages of content. Now we get paid for reports. I mean, that's, that's our product, is reporting. For some companies, we produce 80 or 90 different, per week different types of reports. There's the mm -hmm. chief marketing officer wants a report. Then there's the local Instagram channel manager in France wants a report. And they have to be different. And they have to be specified and tailored. And I think journalists are very good at handling reports like that. So if you come from a, a content background or a creative background, you're, you're the special person, so you can work, and they work hand in hand. So mm -hmm. a very wide mix of people, very eclectic, actually. They're, they're the most interesting team in our agency at the moment, because I thought the designers would always be the crazy ones, but it's the data people. <laughs> um, if you like questions now, you can start uh, thinking about some, and you can also ask in German if you like. We have a few more questions here on uh, Slido, which are very sp specific. One is uh, for Tor, and somebody's asking, can you be a bit more specific regarding the simple model to identify articles which go behind the paywall? Yeah, so, so, so this model is for Svenska Dagbladet, which is a subscription first newspaper. So the model will not work for, for instance, VG or Aftonbladet or more reach-based uh, newspapers. But the model is based on um, momentum in reading. That, that's, it's, 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 um, it's, it's more elements, but the, uh, the most important element is momentum in reading. So if an article gets reading, read more and more and more and more and more and more, then this uh, data model wants to lock the article. And, and the main thing with, we see with that is, is that we are too busy thinking about the competitor situation because we, we think that an article cannot be locked because it's a lot of the same articles on the competitors. But that's not the way we see that um, our um, readers think because they want to read that articles on our brand. So that's the main uh, kind of learning from us. So that, that's the main in, ingredients there. Mm -hmm. 
And we have one for um, Matthias. What are best practice examples for storytelling um, based on uh, new data findings? What is the next step in realizing those stories? Okay. Uh, we learned a new way of storytelling for mobile uh, from a 70 year old guy, uh, Mario Garcia. Um, we talked about him earlier. Um, it's a new way of storytelling, kind of the stories we um, heard uh, before here, uh, like um, visual kind of uh, image or video combined with text. And we did this as a test and learned that the stories are 70% um, better in, in kind of score and reach and also uh, subscription revenue. And uh, so we uh, scaled it. And now we, I think we have 300 of them uh, across the newsroom. Are there any questions from the audience you'd like to ask personally? No. So I'd like to ask everyone here on stage, um, what future scenarios does uh, data hold? What do you think, Corinna? What, what would you like to see? I, I, I think I would like to see us um, communicating more focused, more effectively with m m to the, the audience you want to reach out. And I think that's what data does. Um, I wouldn't try to foresee too much because things keep changing, but I think this is definitely the path we are going, going, to, going along. Would you like to continue? Yeah, it's a, I, I, yeah, I have no idea, but I do think it's a great tool. It's really, it's really, it's really great when we're, we're thinking of campaigns or ideas or stories to be able to look at what people are talking about. Uh, an anecdote from when I was working at Volkswagen, when Dieselgate started, they were losing it. They thought they were dead. And I scanned their channels. I had no tool at the time. I scanned their channels for about three days. And I went over to the headquarters and I said, look, the Spiegel hates you, but your fans don't. You've got, and you've got 15 million followers on Facebook and the Spiegel in Germany has, what is it, 500,000 readers? What do you care? Just talk to, your, talk to your audience. And I gave them examples of what their audience were talking about. And I said, they don't want to see an advertising strategy. They just want to know, is my car or is it not my car? And that was really interesting because they were talking about really rolling out an advertising campaign across Europe, which would have cost millions and millions of euros and probably would have been egg on their face. Because people just really wanted to know something very simple. So I suppose, yeah, it does enable us. Thanks. Yeah, we think a lot about <clears throat> um, maximize the value we could bring for our customers. And data helps us to understand better what their hidden wishes are. And one last thing, uh, we talk a lot about our data and analytics, and there is so much data out there, like what people are searching on Google. And Google is still the most powerful traffic source. And um, this is one we are still struggling uh, to bring our editors and journalists to uh, look after the search phrases uh, people search around this topic before they write. Yeah, if you look at future uh, hope, or uh, um, I, I think that the data to make us a lot more uh, customer-driven or customer-centric and also more p more personalized will be super important. And I think, for instance, Spotify is a very good example there. They're very good, actually. So thank you so much, everyone on stage. I hope you got some insights. Uh, if you have more specific questions, don't be shy. Ask them after the panel and see you after the break.